Uh, we started a conversation last night I wanted to return to. Really, it's a, an age-old discussion that's been going on since the, the time of the Buddha. And it's really a question of gradual cultivation, gradual illumination, and sudden awakening, sudden illumination. The Buddha organized Buddhist practices, primarily borrowing from the yogic traditions. Most of what we practice can be traced back to those sources. And the yogic sources influence both Hinduism and Buddhism. The Theravadan Buddhist uh, tradition has landed a little more in the gradual cultivation model, even though there's experiences we could call sudden. Things like a jhana experience, things like cessation are experiences that are, even though there's a cultivation aspect to it, there's a suddenness, there's a lightning bolt to the actual experience. The Buddha, his awakening is really the foundation, the cornerstone of Buddhism. And the awakening he had was a sudden awakening. He was meditating. Uh, he decided to not arise from the spot where he was under the famous Bodhi tree. And the belief is that he sat for seven days and seven nights without moving. And he was assailed by Mara. Mara is often depicted as sort of an evil force. I view Mara as being his psychological resistances to awakening, his commitment to his personality and the personality workings. Who better to trip us up than us? So with that sudden awakening, that became a, a part of Buddhism. The Zen tradition has really anchored that positioning and practice, even though there's gradual cultivation as part of the Zen tradition also. Things like shikantaza are done to purify, to cultivate, to orient towards the mystery, towards the absolute, opening to the sudden awakening, the illumination that can happen. So in my teaching, there's both the cultivation that we're doing, things like being with innate goodness. Um, I teach the heart practices, which I think are terribly important. They're both a gradual cultivation. We mature our relationship to our heart and to our uh, relationships with others, the different groups, while at the same time connecting with a quality of the absolute, a heart quality of the absolute. And that has the potential for jhana in the Brahma Viharas, the heart practices. So there's a sudden quality also to those practices. The other practices that I teach that we're doing, the shikantaza opens up to the absolute. Um, anytime we're journeying in the absolute, uh, awakening is a possibility. It's happened for a number of students of mine in the last few years either within the, the guided meditation or following, like the after, aftermath of a guided meditation seems to prompt that. So this is really the dynamic of, of Buddhism. And to me, there, there isn't a simple answer on what's right or what's wrong. I think that both approaches have value. Uh, both have a purpose. If, if one were to have a uh, awakening, a sudden awakening early in their meditative career, they would spend more time cultivating. Cultivating to mature the personality, to have the personality be a better expression of the awake state. And that, that is something that happens to everyone anyway. But if one were early enough, that would become a more important cultivation. So again, the dynamic is within Buddhism, but we have both and both practices and both 
result in the same thing in terms of realization of the absolute. And it's really a realization of the absolute by the absolute. The, one of the big mistakes people make is they believe that the personality is going to awaken and it's not. The personality doesn't go on the journey. Awareness and consciousness go and that's where awakening happens. And then we bring it back into the personality and try to figure out, as I mentioned, how to make this personality be a better vehicle for expressing the understanding, the realization that's happened. So part of the process of awakening, one of the experiences that can happen when we're journeying in the absolute is called absence of self. Traditionally in Buddhism, it's called no self. And that's a, an experience where we're in the absolute, awareness and consciousness are there, but there's just no markers of me. There's no sense that I'm there as a personality. Thoughts can become quiet, even stopping, so we don't have thoughts as a way of recognizing ourselves. We don't have a lot of the uh, emotions, memories. That's why I have the I am not practice. That's actually positioning us towards the absolute and towards absence of self. If we unplug from all of those, we're going to be experiencing absence of self. And when absence of self first arises for any of us, the, the immediate reaction is to look for what I call the markers of me. This is my name. This is my age. This is my family. This is what I do for a living. You know, all of that all the markers, all the ways we know ourselves, our likes and dislikes, all of that. And so the strategy when absence of self arises, if you have an experience where you actually don't know who you are, if I were to ask you, who are you? Your answer would be, I don't know. And that would be an accurate answer. So it's learning to stay with that I don't know, the discomfort, the unfamiliarity with it. And then at some point we will go back into the self. We will reassert it. It'll be too much to stay in the absence. And so generally most people have repeated experiences of absence of self lasting longer and longer. When I was some years ago working through this territory, I'd have absence of self experiences that would last weeks and months. I would wake up in the morning and I would have no idea who I was. It would just be, it wasn't so much being disoriented. I just wasn't oriented to a me. And it's a strange phenomenon. And of course, most of us think, well, if I get to that point, I won't be able to function in my life. I won't be able to maintain relationships. I won't be able to do my job. And we can do all of that without a self. It's really surprising. You, you remember how to do these things. You remember the relationships. And in fact, the relationships, surprisingly, get a little better because we're not putting that filter of personality to personality in the relationship. We're cleaner, we're fresher in meeting the other. And with deepening realization, I go through this in my book, Demystifying Awakening, there gets to be a realization. There's sort of three category of realization in the Zen tradition. Kensho is sort of blanket term to mean awakening. And it particularly points to first awakenings when one first experiences reality as it is. There's the awakeness and that can last anywhere from a minute to months. Uh, typically if one lasts, if it lasts for weeks or months, it's going to be fairly deep awakening. That's how we, we categorize is based on how long it lasts. And at some point, the usual self will begin to assert itself. Not in the same way, not with the same conviction, but the personality will begin to operate again. And that becomes the, the titration where that individual will be experiencing the vastness, the absolute, the purity of all that, the love of all that, and then other times they'll be in the personality. And so part of the journey is really looking at the personality workings. 
why do I do this this way? Is this the best way? Is this the, more, the most wholesome way that represents my deepest understanding? And so personality behaviors begin to change, become more congruent with realization. And over time, we have more awakening experiences. And then there's a critical period where the way I language it, I mean, it's not exactly like this, but when 51% of an individual consciousness is awake, that awakeness begins to stay in a particular way. And that experience, I, I use the term satori. That means that there's an awakeness where the personality is no longer the foundation. Our true nature, the absolute in our consciousness, becomes our foundation always. And so that continues. So that changes the perspective and the workings of that individual. And that there still is a watching of behavior, looking at the personality, trying to see, is my behavior comporting with my realization? And I say my realization is not accurate, just the realization that happened in this consciousness. It's not a possession. And then there's finally a third level of realization in the Zen tradition called Daigo Teite. Daigo means great. So it means great or final realization or awakening. In reality, it's not the final realization, but it's another stepping stone. It's a big one that when that happens, the sense of self uh, is gone, gets vanquished by the absolute and the absolute becomes the foundation. So for those few individuals I know, when they self-reference, the absence is what they're referencing internally. And so that's sort of the progression of, of awakening and why absence of self is an important part of the process. And I mention all this because I want to normalize it where if you're feeling during the retreat times when you don't know exactly who you are, that's part of the process. So try and relax and just let that be and try not to rush back to assert who you are. <clears throat>